Good morning, church. It's always good to be with you, to worship the Lord with you, to be in the Word with you. So let's come to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are here this morning because we've come to worship you. We've come to be with you. We're here as the language of this psalm this morning we're studying says, we've tasted and saw, saw that you were good and we have come back to worship you and be with you. I pray as we study this this morning, Lord, that our hearts would be stirred with gratitude, with testimony of your goodness towards us. I pray that we will be stirred towards loving you and obedience and following you in all of your ways. I pray that we will be stirred to run to you in every moment of trial or hardship. May you help us even this morning taste and see that you are good again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I remember the first roller coaster I went on. It was Six Flags in California. It was called Rodents Revenge. I had seen roller coasters. I had observed them. I had watched videos of them. But I'd never been on one before. Everything I had saw about that coaster, everything I knew of coasters, didn't compare at all to what I knew after getting off. (laughs) I can think of another ride I went on that was transformative in that kind of experience. It was when the Spider-Man ride first came out at Islands of Adventure. The first time going on a ride where it wasn't just up and down and left and right, but there was fire and water and 3D things. Like I had, I had saw the video, I'd been on, but I never experienced anything like that before. I knew a lot about it, but I knew it in a whole new way. I'll tell you one more, one more. Because I had not felt this experience from an attraction in many years, many years. I I had an invitation to go to the new Star Wars Galaxy's Edge recently. I went out there and I saw there was a fancy ride, supposed to be really crazy, like, okay, whatever, watch some videos or some stuff. Made a point to to get on that ride. And I have never felt like that from an attraction in I don't know how long. I knew what to expect, but there's a kind of knowing, though, that's more than just understanding stuff, more than just learning or watching or seeing. There's a kind of knowing that comes when you experience something for the first time. To use the language of our psalmist this morning, there's a kind of knowing that comes, not just when you study, dissect, read, explain, but when you taste and when you see. In our tradition, well, in our church, in churches like ours, we we are so careful to say things precisely and correctly about God and his word. And that's very good. We should do that. We are also so careful not to let our feelings or emotions dictate what we believe. And that's good. And they shouldn't. But at times, that can drive us to a tendency of knowing God in terms of axioms and principles of truth. But the psalmist this morning The point of our text says, that's wonderful, but have you tasted? Have you seen that the Lord is good? Have you known him, not just in principle, in idea, in concept, but have you drunk deeply and tasted that he is good? So that's going to be our sermon this morning, is walking through as the psalmist encourages us, calls us to taste and see that he is good. In the first part of our sermon, we're going to be looking at Tasting and testimony. How does tasting and testimony go together? The second part is going to be tasting and the fear of the Lord. And then lastly, what does tasting the Lord have to do with us as we walk through the troubles of this life? So we're going to our text now. Not in Numbers, but in Psalms. The psalmist opens this encouragement to taste and see with three verses of him just overflowing in worship. Listen and just hear it. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. This psalm has been written to instruct us to taste and see the Lord is good. And before he can even get to explaining that and calling us to it and walking us through it, what does he do? He cannot help but worship and call all those who are reading to worship with him. And here's why. Because those who have tasted 
and seen that the Lord is good, there is a natural overflow in them when they think of their Lord. They cannot help but worship. They cannot help having tasted and seen that he is good. They cannot stop themselves but to sing his praises and glorify and adore him. So with that, I want to start by just asking maybe a, a question. When you walk in here on Sunday mornings, when you gather with the people of God and you hear the music kick on, or hit it, Chuck or whoever's up there, however we, we did it in VBS this week, is there something inside of you that is overwhelmed to lift your voice? Something that lights up within you as you get to glorify and sing praises and worship about the one who has saved and redeemed and changed and transformed you? Is there something in you that is stirring to worship your God? I hope so. My question isn't to that group, but to a different group. If you walk in, is there a part of you that can't wait to get through the music? It's not you, Stephanie, I promise. Is there a part of you that looks around and is like, can people just calm down a little bit? I wonder if maybe that's you, just maybe, because you have not tasted and seen that the Lord is good. The worship of God's people is troublesome or bothersome when you come to church because you're coming to learn some information, but you've not actually tasted and seen that he is good, and therefore your heart does not fill and overflow with worship as you gather with God's people. Just maybe you have trouble worshiping in song and with music, just maybe because you don't actually have a testimony in your life yet of the goodness of the Lord. Wouldn't that make sense though? Wouldn't singing songs about God's salvation be kind of pointless for the person who hasn't yet rested in the Lord for his salvation? Wouldn't singing songs of his beauty and his glory just be a bit off-putting and abstract for the person who does not look at the Lord and see him as beautiful and glorious? Wouldn't songs about his deliverance and his rescue and his presence kind of be nonsense to the one who has not been delivered or rescued or comforted by the Lord? Perhaps worship, worship in song, is difficult, troublesome, abstract, because you have not yet tasted and seen that the Lord is good. So how does one begin to get a testimony of tasting and seeing? And the psalmist actually gives us, in his own worship and testimony, some things to help guide us to answer this question. Looking back to the psalm, Psalm 2, or Psalm, sorry, Psalm 34, verse 2, listen to his testimony of having tasted and seen. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Listen, let the humble hear and be glad. Verse 4, I sought, and he answered, and delivered me from all my fears. Verse 5, look to him who are radiant, their faces shall never be ashamed. Verse 6, the poor man, sorry, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. There are some really key things in each of these verses here. Verse 2, it says, let the humble be glad. The testimony of the one who has tasted and seen the Lord as good is a testimony of someone who is humble, who has been broken before the Lord, been broken by life, does not see themselves as greater or more highly than they ought, but sees themselves as one who has been brought low. If you've not been brought low, it's hard to imagine how you have tasted the goodness of the one who lifts up. Look at verse 4. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. I'm sorry. Yeah, I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. The psalmist admits that he was a man who was caught in fear. Whether that was over his own sin facing his creator, that was in challenges of life and circumstance, he was fearful. 
And in his fear, he sought the Lord and found comfort and strength. If you have never found yourself in a place of fear, of being overwhelmed not what to do with what's in front of you, with your own sin or life that has driven you to find help to see the Lord, you have probably not tasted and seen that he is good. It goes all the way through each one. The, those who look to him are radiant. Looking is the one who goes to find help. The helpless one is the one who runs to the Lord and tastes and sees that he is good as the Lord helps him in his moment of need. This poor man... In other versions, it might say the desperate one or the helpless one. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him. The last thing, verse 7, the angel encamps. The picture here is you have a force, a military, a sort of some sort who don't have the means to protect and defend themselves. So the Lord has to encamp around to defend them. The testimony of the one who worships, who has tasted and seen the Lord is good, is the one who has been broken and humbled, overwhelmed by fear, felt helpless and desperate and defenseless. The one who looks at their life, looks at themselves and knows, I have nothing to give and nowhere to go. Will someone deliver me? Can someone save me? And they turn their eyes up from the ground to the Lord and they find salvation and they taste and they see that the Lord is good and therefore when the kids cry hit it Chuck their hearts are ready to worship their minds are full of the thoughts of God's presence his comfort his salvation his deliverance how do you taste and see that the Lord is good we have to have a testimony of being low and brought down so that you look up and you are ready to taste. I'll give you an example, one example of this. I am confident that you all have tried an orange before, right? Right? Orange, just a little orange thingy. Not a clementine, not a tangerine, but an orange, right? They're sweet, you know, they're delicious. But I promise you, you have never really tasted an orange until just the middle of July and you're at the soccer field complex, and you're on your second of your three games that day, and the whistle blows for halftime, and the soccer mom of that day opens a giant cooler full of ice and quartered orange wedges, and you grab one, and you put it in your mouth, and you taste it. That is the first time in your life you will truly taste an orange. That is the first time where you are so parched and desperate, something cool, refreshing, and sweet, to where you really get what on earth it is to taste and see that this orange is good. And for each of us here, how can you taste and truly see the Lord is good if you have not been totally parched from this life, from yourself, and the things of this world? So what do we do with this? Well, I actually have a challenge for everyone this morning. For everyone. Are you ready for it? Here's the challenge for you all. If you've tasted and seen the Lord is good, that means you have a testimony of how he's been good to you. Okay? Your testimony could be something as dramatic as when you were in college, you know, you were away from the Lord, so you were, you know, selling drugs and stealing people's shoes. That could be your testimony. The Lord saved you from that. And that's a wonderful testimony. But for many of us, that might not be our testimony. For some of us, Our life with the Lord might be that we'd never remember a moment not trusting in Him and knowing Him. But regardless of where your journey started along the way, you can identify moments where you've cried out, where you've been helpless, where you've been fearful, where you've been brought low, and you've turned to Him, and He has comforted and answered and healed and drew near. I want you today to share that story with somebody, with your family over lunch or on the phone, with a cashier if you're waiting in line. You know, don't you do it today. Look for opportunities today and this week to do what we see in this text. Be overwhelmed by the goodness of the Lord in your life and just share it with somebody. 
What a wonderful way to respond to this first part. But to do what we see the psalmist doing, testifying, declaring that the Lord is good. And we have tasted and seen that in our own lives. So having tasted and seen, and having a testimony from that, the next part, part of our psalm here, kind of the center of it, brings us to this idea of tasting and the fear of the Lord. Now the point of this psalm, actually, it's kind of neat. If you could read Hebrew, which... Um, I'm not saying I can, but I know how to look at it. And, um, but if you were to read it in Hebrew and look at it, it actually is an acrostic psalm. You know what acrostic is? It's just, you have the alphabet, A through Z, right? And you write a poem, and each line of your poem begins with the next letter in the alphabet. This is actually an acrostic poem in Hebrew. So every verse begins with the next letter in the Hebrew alphabet. The center of this psalm actually focuses right in on verse 11. Listen, come, O children, and listen to me. The purpose of this psalm was actually meant to be a, an instructional tool, probably for children and young people, to teach them about the fear of the Lord. That's kind of the heart of this, the fear of the Lord. Now you pause and go, wait a minute, I thought we are talking about tasting and seeing he is good, and now you're telling me it's about fearing the Lord. This seems to be a dramatic um, opposition between these two ideas. How does fearing the Lord and tasting and seeing that, he, how do these ideas come together? It appears to be a weird juxtaposition of contradictory things, or at least very different ideas. But that is not the case. This is not the case. He brings them right together. Verses 8 and 9. Oh, taste and see that he is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. And verse 9. Oh, fear the Lord, you saints, for those who fear him have no lack. For the psalmist, these two ideas are not in any way intention or contradiction, but rather they come together perfectly. And I'm going to tell you how. Are you ready for this? I'm going to start with the idea of an egg fight. Now, when I first was told by my mother I can go outside and have an egg fight, I was raised in the Pacific Northwest, and there's another kind of popular fight we have during the winter. It's called a snowball fight. So my mom said, go have an egg fight. What you're thinking is what I thought and what I did with my friend. We went outside with a big basket of hard-boiled eggs. It was Easter. We had an Easter egg hunt. We squared up about... 15, 20, 30 feet apart on the, on the road, each with a basket of hard-boiled eggs, and we began to launch them at one another. And man, it was so much fun. Now, my mom saw this, and she went outside, and, go, and she stopped us. Apparently, we misunderstood what egg fight was. So if you don't know, egg fight is kind of like a wishbone game. You know, you break the wishbone. An egg fight, you just have two hard-boiled eggs. Each person has one, and you tap them on top of another to see which one cracks first. Very different than what I had in mind. <laughs> Very different. Um, so what we had to do for having misunderstood the, the game, the rules properly, we now had to, in five minutes, we exhausted our bales of hard-boiled eggs, and for the next who knows how long, we were cleaning up the neighborhood street. It seemed like fun in the moment, but the result of not knowing the game, not playing the game right, created much more work and hardship on the back end. But one more example. If I was to bring you to a, a buffet of some sort, a potluck here at the church, and I want you to enjoy the potluck, and you walk in, and your idea of enjoying the potluck was to start flipping tables. Are you really going to enjoy the potluck? That might sound fun, you know, for a moment, but are you really going to enjoy what was set before you? The way it was given, all the flavors, the, the love and the, you don't want sweat and tears in the food, I guess, but the love and the desire. Are you going to be able to taste and experience all that was really given to you? The answer is no. We're called in this to taste and see that the Lord is good, to drink deeply of him. And how do we do that? Well, we fear the Lord. How do you play the Easter egg? egg fight game, you crack it. You don't throw them. How do you enjoy the potluck laid before you? With a bowl and a spoon, not by flipping tables. How do you taste? How do you enjoy? How do you drink deeply of all that is laid out for us to enjoy? You walk with him. You follow his rules. You, you fear the Lord. You fear the Lord. So often we are tempted to look at God's commands his instructions to us as a grind, 
as a burden. But what they really are is the guidance from him, the instructions from him on how we are to enjoy all that he has given us. He has delivered us. He has saved us. He has given us life itself. He says, let me tell you how to enjoy, to really see what this was all for you about, how to get the most out of what I've given you. You obey me. And just think about it. I mean, I probably go through this every time we talk about this idea, but doesn't that just make sense? Doesn't it just make sense? Let's go through just the last five commandments, okay? Honor your father and your mother. How many of you, well, I don't want to say that. Are you surprised when your parents don't trust you when you refuse to honor them? This command applies not just to households, but to all places where there's authority in your life. You could be honoring the same way. It can be applied to there in a similar way. Your boss doesn't trust you. Well, you don't honor or respect him. Your kids or your parents don't respect you. Well, you don't respect them either. Is it, any, is it any wonder why a life of lack of respect and lack of honor doesn't seem to create relationships that are honorable and respectable? It's intuitive. Thou shalt not kill. We know through Jesus' words that that doesn't just mean outward unjust murder or killing, but it also means in your heart, right? To harbor anger and unforgiveness. Is it any surprise that those of us who harbor unforgiveness and anger in our lives have trouble getting along with the people around us? Have trouble having good relationships when in our heart we constantly carry unforgiveness, anger, judgment, we wonder why we have no friends. It makes sense. Do not kill, not even in your own heart. For if you don't obey this, look what happens to your relationships. Adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. First of all, sermon on this last week. Even did a children's sermon on this last week. That was a fun one to teach to the kids. But is it any wonder why you feel discontent and unsatisfied in your marriage or with your spouse when you spend your energy drinking deeply and feeding your lust and not the one the Lord has given you in your marriage. Any wonder at all? It makes sense. We can go through them all. I won't. But maybe something you could do later on in your quiet time or whenever. If you want to taste, if you have tasted his deliverance and his salvation, you want to taste the goodness of him in all of life, he has laid out a very simple guide on how to taste and eat from all that he has put before us. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And now this brings us to the, the third kind of part of this psalm this morning. It takes us to tasting and the troubles of of life, having tasted and seen that he was good, having a testimony of that, understanding that to truly taste every flavor, to get this stuff to go through all of your palate, you need to obey and honor him. What do we do having tasted now and experiencing the troubles and cares of this life and the world? Well, the first thing the psalmist wants us to see, verse 19, is that we should be expecting troubles in this world. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Tasting and seeing that he is good, being delivered by him before being saved, does not um, invalidate or reject the opportunity, the possibility for more troubles in life. In fact, tasting and seeing that he is good is in no way in opposition to experiencing hardship and difficulty. The psalmist tells us, after calling us to taste and see, tells us that the afflictions of the righteous that we will face are many, are many. Not just us, but it talks about the afflictions of the wicked as well. And the point here being that they, although all people, 
Those who love and follow the Lord, who have tasted and seen he is good, and those who reject him and have no desire for him, all people will experience hardship and affliction. We're similar in that regard. However, the experience of all people is not the same. Whether you love the Lord or hate the Lord, affliction will come. But whether you love the Lord or hate the Lord, that affliction will be very different from how you walk through it. Listen to what it says here in verses 15 and 16. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears toward their cry. You hear that? So affliction will come, but the eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous. The Lord hears their cry. 16. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. In the moment of trial and hardship, the one who has tasted and seen the Lord is good can know that the Lord hears them and sees them. He will be there to deliver them. For the one who has rejected the Lord, who does not know that he is good, has not tasted and followed him in their affliction, they can know that the Lord will use that to crush them and to judge them. Very different experience for the same afflictions that come upon all peoples. But it continues, though. Listen to what it says. Verse 16, 17. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Verse 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Now, if you're paying attention, there's a lot of depictions of what the Lord is doing in here. It says, for the righteous, for his children, right? It says he sees them, his eyes are on them. Not only are his eyes on them, but second part of verse 15, it says his ears are toward their cry. Verse 17, when they cry, it says he hears again. He has his eyes, his ears. Now it's saying he's actually hearing them. Verse 18, the Lord is near. He draws near to them. Now, we talked about this last time I preached about the presence of the Lord being with us, lifting us up out of hardship. And we're not going to go through all that again. If you want to hear all that again, that was like a month ago, and you can play it back online. What I want to do instead is understanding that the Lord delivers those who call upon him, those who belong in him. How does having tasted and seen that the Lord is good, what do we do with that new piece of information in our hardship? I have three things for you. Any children here? Okay, it's for you guys as well. This is something that you might struggle with, and that I struggle with, and that all of us probably struggle with. What does the one who has tasted and seen do in the midst of affliction? The first thing we do is we remember our testimony. The Lord has saved me. He has delivered me. He has healed me. I have cried out to him before, and he heard and came near. If that was always true before in this affliction today, it will also be true. So the first thing we do, having tasted and seen, is we remember how delicious it was to feast and to taste. We remember when he came through all those times before, and we trust and believe that this time is not any different. He is still good, and we can still taste and see and believe that no matter what we walk through. That one's a little easy, probably, but do that. Remember what he's done before in the moment of hardness or fear. The second thing we do is this remembering what he's done, but we actually run to the one who delivers us. Yes, afflictions are many. We understand that the Lord uses our sufferings. We know all that, right? We're good, reformed Christians. We understand that God uses all things, even our hardships for his glory. But having tasted and seen that he is good, what should we do in our hardship? We remember what he's done, and we run to him again, and we plead and cry, Lord, would you do that again? Would you save and deliver and rescue and heal and comfort me again? He is a good father who wants his children to come to him with all of their burdens and needs. He is a good father who has healed and comforted and restored and will do it 
again. And we'll do it again. And the third one might be a little different. Um, it's actually one that probably is thrown at Christians as maybe a slur at times even. But the third one is that we remember his promise to completely deliver. We understand that every affliction he brings us out of is just one affliction in a span of many that will be awaiting us, right? But there will be a day, there will be a time when he fully delivers his children, his creation from all affliction and hardship. I have no problem looking out into the world, looking at the things going on around us, some of the health things maybe that I wrestle with, that you wrestle with, and going, would you come, Lord Jesus? I know you can heal and make better, but would you just come back and fix all of this stuff? That is okay. There are some injustices in this world that will only be resolved when the judge returns. So the one who has tasted and seen that he is good longs for that return in the face of hardship. There are some sufferings and illnesses and trials we go through that will not be alleviated, relieved, until he returns and restores and redeems all things back to the way it should be. And it is okay in the midst of trial and hardship to long for that return, to long for that relief from suffering, knowing that he has promised and will do it. That is okay, church. There are some things in our lives and our world that will not be fixed until glory himself comes. And all things are swallowed up in his new creation he is bringing for us. So we remember what he's done. We come to him again. But church, we long for the day when he returns and makes all things right. Now, I say this could be a little controversial because there are people who hear that last part and go, it sounds like you're just trusting in God as a way to escape the hard things in life. There are Nietzsche's of the world who would call you to stand at the abyss, the edge of darkness, and look out and see that there is nothing there. It's all dark around us. There is no point or no meaning or no value. Suffering, nothing. Love and joy, nothing. That's, I reject that. There are those who would do what maybe Carl Sagan does, right? He looks at a picture of Earth from deep into space. He's a little pale blue dot. and says, there it is, that's it. That's everything. That's all we know. There it is. Find a way to contend yourself with the hardship of life because that's all you're going to find there is trying to churn through the mud and get to the other side. There's those who love John Lennon's Imagine. Imagine, no. Heaven above, no. Wait, is that right? I don't know. Heaven above, no. Hell below, right? All we have is this, so let's make the best of what we have. You know what, church? I've tasted and seen the Lord is good. I know this is not all there is. I know this is not the best we have. I know I don't have to be content with just suffering through this because he will come back and he will make all things new and all things right and I can hope and long for that. So I remember when I've tasted before. I come to him in hardship when I'm going through it now and I long for the day when he will make all things new and then I will, and who I never have before, really taste that orange for the first time. There's a, weird, there's a weird end to this, and I want to look at a couple more verses as we come to a close here. There's a really awkward ending. I, I wonder what would a, a Jewish person would have done reading this on their own before Christ returned. Look at these last few verses here, 19, or, uh, 19 through 22. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. I like that part. He keeps all his bones not one of them is broken. Pause. Wait a minute. I made it to like 30, I think, with no broken bones. I broke some now. I don't understand what this, I don't understand what to do with that. Affliction will be slayed, affliction, sorry, affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate righteousness will be condemned. How are we bringing condemnation? That was, 
no broken bones. We're talking about moral judgments now, condemnation. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. There's this weird pivot at the end where it goes from God's deliverance and God's doing things to bring us out of hardship and hope. It turns to now this, this spiritual moral judgment. It talks about redemption and condemnation. And it has that weird line about bones. What are we to do with this? Well, I think you might know where I'm going. It's actually a prophecy that Christ fulfills on the cross as the Romans were coming through to break the bones of those who were on the cross to speed up their death. They got to the, our Lord. And what did they find? He had already died. His bones did not have to be broken. If the psalmist here is prophetically looking forward to that moment, unbeknownst to themselves probably, thinking that there will be someone who will come and will do something to redeem his people, something to avert condemnation from them as he redeems them. How does Christ fulfill all that? And I want to share one verse outside of our psalm with you from the book of Hebrews that seems to touch this whole idea, our whole sermon this morning, perfectly. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. I like hearing pages turn. You don't have to, but I like it. Whenever I say that, more turn afterwards. Kind of a weird, like, guilty way to get you all to look with me. <laughs> Hebrews 2, chapter 9. Sorry, chapter 2, verse 9. The author of Hebrews says this. But we see him for a little while, that's Jesus, was made lower than the angels, meaning he became to come from a man, walked as a servant among us, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor, because of the suffering of death. Pause right there. Crown with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Jesus, the King of glory, creator of the heavens and earth, came down to become as we are, to walk among us, he experienced the life that we lived, that we live, and check this. He tasted the death that we deserve so that we who turn to him might taste and see that he is good. We deserve the death he tested. We deserve the death he tasted. And therefore, when we turn from our sins and we trust in him, we can taste his goodness and see his goodness in our lives behind us, in our lives and our hardships right now, and in the life he is preparing for us in the days and age to come. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Father, we, we thank you. We thank you because you give us such a tremendous privilege. I think of so many other religions in the world where God is a concept, God is an idea, where the idea of knowing God is purely cerebral. But you come to us in this psalm. You come to your children and you tell us to taste and to see, to drink deeply from you. To not just know you in our heads, but to know you as we overflow with worship, having been saved and delivered and rescued by you again and again and again. May your testimony fill our lips in all that we do. May we seek to turn from sin and walk in godliness, tasting every flavor of goodness that you have chosen to bless us with. And may we run to you in the moment of our hardship, pleading for your deliverance again and looking forward to the day when you make all things new. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord. Amen.
pews remain while we prepare for the benediction, church. The Lord is good. He is so good. We talked about being in hardship and running to the Lord, and I want you to know that it is the desire of our heart that as you run to the Lord, you may also find among us, your elders, your pastors, one another, brothers and sisters that can run with you, can plead with you, can pray with you. So there'll be some elders up here. Actually, I invite them to make your way forward now if they are here. Um, and if you have any needs at all, you want to talk, to the, talk for prayer, counsel, come to know the Lord, would love to speak with you, talk with you, and pray with you. Um, but with that, prepare to receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Love you, church. Amen.